All right, so once again, welcome to uh, Kabbalah Decoded. Uh, today's class is about the idea of channeling power. Channeling power. Now, um, we'll begin by discussing the idea of channeling power sort of in a more spiritual context, and then we'll move on to how this is practical in a um, in a regular sort of in a regular type of context. So, in terms of the svirot, as everybody knows, there are ten svirot, and all of the svirot, each of the svirot has its own particular character or quality. Uh, for example, <coughs> the svira of Chesed. Its particular inner dimensional quality is the idea of love or kindness. Similarly, the Sphira, the uh, divine emanation of Gavura, its particular quality is um, fear or a W E, uh, and can sometimes tend towards the idea of severity or harshness and so on and so forth. Every sphera has its particular quality that it um, imbues the world with <coughs> or alternatively imbues the person with, endows the person with. Now, <coughs> when these spherot are, so to speak, out of balance, then what happens is uh, one quality becomes more dominant than the others, and this happens to everybody and happens all the time uh, in, in the individual and in the world in general. So the, um, when things are out of balance, then the qualities which are less dominant um, kind of get ignored or pushed aside, so to speak. So obviously, the thing that we want to do is to bring uh, all of the qualities into their proper balance. Now, the proper balance doesn't mean to say 50-50, necessarily, that every quality has to have, since the tenths we wrote, every quality gives 10%. Not necessarily. Everybody's different. And every person has their own, um, <clears throat> their own um, purpose in being here in the world. And since each individual has his own purpose, he's going to be a different mix he, she is going to be a different mix from every other person. When we say imbalance, we mean imbalance for the purpose of that particular soul in the world. <coughs> now, obviously, finding the particular purpose that a soul has in this world, that a person has in this world, that is itself another whole uh, discussion, uh, and that's not for now. But nevertheless, that's the way it is. As long as there is um, uh, the person for the, in terms of their functioning and their purpose in this world, they're more or less in balance, things are fine. However, there's, just, there's more than bringing things merely into balance. When every power of the ten powers of a person's soul, or when every sphera of the ten spherot of each of the planes of reality is working in its proper function, in other words, it's working fully and in a balanced way with every other power, with every other sphera. Then what happens is, because of the proper working together of all the parts, the whole that is greater than the sum of the parts is elicited. Again, let me just say that again. When everything is working in the proper order and they're working harmoniously, there's a harmony between the ten aspects of a person's soul or between the ten uh, spherot, the ten divine powers that run the world, so to speak. Not so to speak, that's the way it is that run the world. Then there is something that is drawn down that is greater than the sum of its parts, the whole that is greater than the sum of, the, uh, of its parts. This is called in Kabbalah, uh, it is called Ha'or Ha'ole Al-Kulana, the light that transcends them all. In terms of the Svirot, 
as we know, there are the ten svirot, um, beginning with Chochma, Chochma bin Adat, etc., etc. And um, if anyone wants to look at a map of this or a chart of this, uh, there's a chart available in the um, in the archives, the same archives where you pull up videos. If you go on our website, kabbaladecoded.com, kabbaladecoded.com, if you go to the videos and classes tabs. Uh, you'll see there a form that you can just fill out the form. It doesn't cost anything, whatever. I don't share your email. Just fill out the form, and it'll take you to a Dropbox link. Submit the form. It opens a Dropbox link, and there in the Dropbox, you will see a chart of the Svirot and the soul powers, the various charts over there that you can download for, your, uh, for free. <clears throat> so in any event, when all of the Svirot from Chochmah all the way through to Malchut, are operating in their proper measure, that then draws down the light of Keter, the light of Keter which transcends them all. It draws down the light of Keter which transcends them all. Now, the question is, what is what happens with that light of Keter when it is drawn down? That's a subject we're going to cover a little bit, uh, a little bit later in a few minutes. We're going to uh, discuss that again. Now, um, we can see this particular quality in a very practical sense as well. For example, uh, it is a custom and it is in fact a mitzvah, a mitzvah meaning a good deed, a proper deed according to the way the Torah sees things. It's a mitzvah commandment to pray together in a minion together in a quorum of 10 of 10 men men ought to pray in a quorum of 10 men women have a different thing they don't have to pray in a quorum uh, because their prayer is much less a communal activity than an internal uh, activity it's a personal activity much more than a communal activity but for men it's a communal activity now if there are only nine men <coughs> in the group if there are only nine men in the group, then they're not able to pray certain prayers out loud and uh, and and say what's going on, Kaddish and Baruch Hu and Kedusha and so on and so forth. There's certain things that they can't do. Only when they're 10 men all together over the age of 13, over the age of a mitzvah, are they able to um, utter these special prayers. And the reason for that is exactly what we mentioned before, because when there's a group of people together that brings down Ha'or ha'ole al kulana, the light that transcends them all. The whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And in fact, this goes much further. There are special blessings uh, that one said, that one would say when you see a very large group of people together. There's a special blessing which is called Chacham Harazim, which means the, the wise one of all secrets. It's talking about uh, God, about the Holy One, blessed be He. Uh, talking about God, uh, where when you see 600,000 people together, 600,000 uh, people together, you say the, the, the blessing, Baruch Chacham Harazim. Blessed is He who is the wise one knowing all secrets. Because when there's a very large group together, that's elicits an even higher level than if there are just 10 or 100 or 1,000, etc., etc. It elicits a much higher level of the light of Keter over the group. That light of Keter, which is called Chacham Arazim, which technically speaking is uh, the idea of Chachma Stima'a. Chachma Stima'a. Chachma Stima'a is a level in Arich Anpin, it's Chochma of Arich Anpin, Chochma Stima, it's called the hidden Chochma, the hidden wisdom. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing about this is that the individuals comprising the group themselves don't necessarily have to be particularly saintly or holy or special or or complete, complete in the sense of their spiritual service, in order for this to happen. 
Why is that? Because what one person is lacking, another person makes up. When you have a group of even 10 people, the spiritual assumption and the spiritual basis really, it's not just an assumption, it's a reality, is that all of the powers of the soul are represented. All of the powers of the soul, therefore all the Sri Rot. Even if it's only in a relative sense. Nevertheless, they are manifested as a whole and can draw down that supernal light, the Or Haole Al Kulana. Now, how much more so is that true when a very large group comes together? Because then we can have all, not only in a general sense, but all the fine gradations of everything manifested as well. And that draws down, as I said before, a much higher light called Chochma Razim, which is the Chochma uh, of Arich Anpin. Chochma Stimo. Okay. Now, I'd like to explain this in terms of um, an event that we spoke about on this uh, past uh, Shabbat. The Torah reading was called Vayakhel, Gathering Together. Now, I'm going to explain it, but first I want to give a little bit of history about what that whole concept of Vayakhel was, gathering together. Moses says that Moses gathered the people together, and he taught them something. He told them something. What was it that he told them? We'll soon find out. Uh, that he told them, we'll soon find out. But we have to go back a little bit in, uh, in history in order to understand what this was all about and why, um, why at this juncture the gathering happened. Now, <clears throat> when the uh, um, Jewish people were in Egypt, if you remember correctly, they came down to Egypt because Joseph, who was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, had been um, sold into slavery in Egypt. He'd been, um, uh, how he got there, let's not, then let's got them not go too, back, uh, far, too far back in history. But he had been sold as a slave, and then uh, he rose up to actually become the uh, viceroy of Pharaoh in Egypt. And he was the one that um, uh, handled all of the royal affairs, all of the affairs of the country. He was in charge of everything, sort of the CEO of Egypt, so to speak. And when a famine hit uh, the land of Canaan and all the lands around, uh, so his, his, uh, his brothers and his father, uh, who hadn't known that he was alive, uh, eventually discover that he's alive, or he reveals that he's alive, and he brings them all down to Egypt. In any event, Joseph eventually, after, um, after his reign, 110 years, he died at the age of 110, and... Um, when he passed away, he was uh, he asked that when the Jewish people would be redeemed from Egypt, because it was a tradition that had been handed down, and they knew that they would only be in Egypt for a certain amount of time, and then they would leave. He asked that his coffin, his body in his coffin, be removed from Egypt, be taken out of Egypt, and taken back to the land of his birth, the land of his forefathers, the land of Israel, and of Canaan was called at the time. But in order not to be an, uh, uh, an, an object of idol worship, he asked that his coffin, or he commanded that his coffin be buried in the Nile River. And so it was. His coffin was buried in the Nile in an unknown place. In other words, not everyone was allowed to see where he was buried. And there was a tradition about where he was, but um, uh, it was handed down from generation to generation. And there uh, the, he was, he remained for about, um, the coffin remained for about 200 years. Now it was time for the Jewish people to leave Egypt. The Redeemer who was take, would take them out of Egypt was Moses. Moses knew the promise that the Jewish people had made, the Israelites had made to, uh, to Joseph, to Yosef, that they would take him out of, um, of the Nile and bury him in the land of Israel. So while everyone else was busy doing all kinds of other things, primarily actually fulfilling 
the promise that God had given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, primarily to Abraham, that your children in the Brisbane of Asarim, the covenant between the pieces, uh, you could read about it if you, if you want. Uh, it's in, uh, in Genesis, sort of in the beginning, the story of Abraham. And Pasha told us, I think it is, yeah, Pasha told us. Uh, so um, Abraham had been told that your children, your descendants will be slaves in Egypt for a period of time, 400 years actually. When they started counting, was uh, let's not go into the, the into that aspect of things. But you would be they would be slaves, and then they would come out with great wealth, with ruchush gadol, with great wealth. And this was known; it's a tradition that was handed down amongst the Israelites, the Jewish people, from the time of Abraham. They knew that this would be the case. In any event, while all the people were gathering the wealth of Egypt. The Egyptians were giving them their gold and their silver, primarily their gold, to sort of get rid of them after the 10 plagues. And so they didn't want them there anymore, get out of here, which was really payment, says uh, Kabbalah. It was really payment for all the slavery that they'd done. It was reparations. So they were given gold as reparations for the slavery, the 400 years of slavery, and building up all of Egypt um, that uh, they never received any payment for. So they received it then in terms of uh, gold and other things, gold, silver, copper. But mostly you know, we're talking about gold over here. You'll see why. <clears throat> so uh, while they were busy collecting all the gold, uh, Moses was busy, Moshe Rabbeinu was busy with the, co with the coffin of Joseph. So he went to the river, and he had, some say he had inscribed on a plate of gold the words, Alei Shor, Alei Shor, which means rise ox, rise ox, and, and a holy name. One of the holy names, one of the, um, one of the names of God. And the purpose was to caused the coffin of Joseph to come up, to float up to the surface so that he could get it. Now, why did he say rise ox, rise ox? Because Joseph's, the symbol, the symbol of Joseph's uh, tribe was the ox. Uh, as it says about him, um, um, that he went up on the shore, it could be read as shore, it could be read as shur, shur, Shur is an ox. Shur means to have uh, not just foresight, but prophetic insight into things. So, Ale Shur, may he, uh, the one who had prophetic saw foresight, rise from, the, rise from the depths of the Nile. In any event, however you read it, Ale Shur or Ale Shur, Shur also means a wall, one who stand because people would stand on the top of the wall to get a sight of Joseph was very magnificently uh, handsome. Number one, and number two, he exhibited this. Uh, he exuded this aura of of holiness and of wisdom and uh, and authority and very. And so the ladies would climb onto the, onto the walls around to to try and catch sight of him. So there's various explanations of what the word shore shur means. But nevertheless, he threw this plate in, and the coffin came up. There happened to be someone there who oversaw, who, who uh, overheard this whole thing, and he looked and he went and he found this metal plate, this gold plate on which was written the words "Ale Shur" or "Ale Shor," and um, the holy name that was on it, and he kept that plate. Fast forward now. <clears throat> the uh, Israelites had left Egypt. They're on their way now to receive the Torah. They heard the Ten Commandments, and Moses goes up the mountain in order to get the Ten Commandments written on the tablets of stone from God. Moses goes up the mountain. He says he's coming back in 40 days. And they start counting. The 40th day comes according to their calculation. And unfortunately, they miscalculated because 40 days meant 40 whole days. And then and the, uh, the day begins from the night before. In uh, the Jewish calendar, the night 
the, the, the day really be, it doesn't begin at midnight. It begins on, at sunset or when the stars come out on the day before. So it goes night and day. Evening and then morning. And uh, that is one day. So when um, uh, they calculated the days, they miscalculated because they counted, uh, they counted the days from as it was done in Egypt, day and night, and not night and day. So by the time they finished calculating their 40 days, it was really only the 39th day, they were afraid that Moses wasn't coming back. So they kind of freaked out, and um, they all gathered in front of Aaron. Now the word over here is Vahikahel. They gathered together. They gathered together in front of Aaron. They said to him, it's Moses who took us out of Egypt, is no longer with us. We need, this is the way it's explained in Kabbalah, we need something that we can relate to in order to guide us further. We need something we can relate to in place of Moses. Not in place of God, in place of Moses. Uh, that we can relate to. Something manifested in this world. We can't deal with the soul of Moses as it is above, in the world's above, because they thought that he died. They saw, they were shown uh, deliberately um, by the forces of evil, they were shown a likeness of Moses ascending on high, it was only a likeness, it wasn't him, and they thought that he died. In any event, they gathered together, and uh, they tell Aaron that they want, uh, they want wanting to make, uh, and the various suggestions started coming, what, what should he make, what should he do? They knew very well, as I mentioned before, that the gold that they were given as payment would be used for some holy purpose in the future. They didn't know exactly what purpose, but they didn't know that the gold would be used for a holy purpose. In fact, later on it was used, the holy purpose that it was really intended for was to build the tabernacle. At that point in time, they didn't really understand yet what the tabernacle was. They just knew it was to, use as a, to be used as a holy purpose in which the divine presence would be revealed, as was in the tabernacle in the Mishkan. They knew that. But they didn't know clearly exactly how it would be. How, they knew that that was what the gold was for, but how it was going to be, they didn't know. So they bring all their gold to Aaron, and they say, we have this gold. It was obviously for this purpose. Make something with it that will be the purpose that we that we need that we need to further that, that that we need this gold for and that will be our the means by which godliness will be revealed in the world as it was through the tabernacle so the um uh, the various people um started donating their gold their gold and this person who had taken the um the plate, the gold plate, on which Moses had written Ale Shor, Ale Shor, or Ale Shur, Ale Shur, which can mean rise ox, rise ox in this holy, this holy name, the holy name of God. This person's name is Micha, by the way. Micha took his donation, this gold plate, and he gave it to Aaron, and Aaron took all of the things together and he threw it in the fire. He wanted to get rid of it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing this. He wanted to get rid of it. All of a sudden, an ox rose out of there. Are they sure? The ox rose. That was the golden calf. It rose out of there and it was alive. It wasn't just a statue that happened or a dead, a dead thing. It was alive. It had life to it. So immediately, um, all of the, uh, the Erev Rav, the Erev Rav being the uh, mixed multitude that had also come out of Egypt. They weren't Israelites originally, but they sort of joined with, together with them. They started singing and, uh, started singing and dancing and, and, making, um, and making this into a real object of worship. They were dancing around it and so on and so forth. And this really is the power of community. As we said before, when you have a community and you have uh, people gathered together, a lot of people gathered together, and in fact it was 600,000, more than 600,000 people gathered together, 
that was a tremendously powerful thing. They drawn, they had drawn down this aura, this light that transcends all things, and they channeled it into the wrong place. They channeled it into idolatry. So when Moses came down from the mountain, he was uh, rightly pretty upset about this whole uh, this whole thing. And after he'd uh, taken this uh, calf and ground it up to dust and thrown it into the water and, uh, and, and you know basically disappeared, and uh, he gave those people uh, he tested to to, to, see, to see who had worshipped. Where Zora by uh, who had worshipped idolatry by giving them giving everybody some of the water to drink, that water with the gold dust in it, those who had uh, worshipped idolatry uh, died. Those who didn't were not were not affected by it. And there's other explanations, but that's uh, that's the, the it was it was the story of the Sota. Either they died or they got so sick that they were. It was known that they were. Um, they had worshipped and they were put to death. Whatever, let's not go. Let's not go there. It's not that relevant. We don't have to talk about the morbid side of things. So now you had the power of this tremendous power that had been arousing the people, the power of the multitude, the power of a crowd, and that power of the crowd had been used in a very, very negative way. So what would you think Moses would do? The normal reaction of most people would be to disperse the crowd. Tell everyone to go home and to make barriers, and this one can't be with that one, and so on. That will disperse the, you know, crowd control is, uh, if you disperse the crowd and break them up, they don't have the power of the crowd anymore. They don't have the or ha'ola al kulana, the, the, the light that transcends them all. Moses didn't do that. He saw that the power of the crowd could be used for good as well. So what did he do? By Yakhel Moshe, Moses gathered everybody together. He gathered all of the people together. And then he instructed them regarding the building of the tabernacle. Not only that, but he said that same gold that you wanted to give for, um, uh, for, for purposes of idol, idolatry, now you're going to use the gold for what, is, what it was really intended for. The sages say that the only reason gold was created was for the sake of the tabernacle, the sake of the Mishkan. That's the only reason gold was created in the first place. For this, and it was covered, like all the walls were covered with gold. Most of the instrument, instruments were made out of gold. In other words, the menorah, the candelabra, and the ark, everything was um, either covered with gold or was made out of pure gold. The gold to be used in uh, in um, in a positive way. That, uh, that's gold has certain qualities. It has a certain beauty to it. It has a certain uh, um, as we all know, gold doesn't tarnish. It remains well, unlike silver. Gold does not tarnish. It remains. It retains its beauty and its shine and its glory. Right throughout, so it represents that that kind of quality of of, of eternity in um, in in spiritual terms as well. So Moses then told all the people, "Donate your gold, but now donate it for something which is yes going to reveal the divine presence. Not that the gold revealed the divine presence, but it made the receptacle." by which the divine presence could be revealed. How the receptacle, when, uh, when a person gives of his, of his wealth, when a person gives, of his, uh, gives to charity or to, uh, to, or to a divine purpose, then all of that wealth of which you took only a small part becomes elevated. A person's wealth becomes elevated into holiness when he gives a part, a tenth part, whatever it may happen to be, to, um, to a holy purpose. So that's what uh, Moses was saying. Now, that, that's what he did. The rectification of the sin of the golden calf was not to destroy or kill those people who had worshipped the, the, uh, the calf. That had to be done as well. But the real rectification was to get them together in a purposeful fashion 
to build something holy, to build something divine, to build a receptacle for divinity and holiness and, the, and for the divine presence to be revealed in the world. And that's what Moses' um, uh, solution to the power of the crowd was. Don't disperse it, don't destroy it. On the contrary, utilize it, but utilize it in a holy way. Now, why is this important uh, for us? Because sometimes we are in crowds where the mood of the crowd uh, is against what a person really feels, against your own, um, against your own inner values, the value system, and so on and so forth. And one has to be careful of that situation. But even more so, this year is what is called the year of gathering, the year of Hakel. Hakel was a is, a is a mitzvah in the Torah, commandment in the Torah, that after the the uh, agricultural cycle in the Torah goes in seven years. Just like the weekday, the six days, and then the seventh, uh, the seventh day is the Sabbath, so too you have a Sabbath of years. So the sabbatical year, or the year called the year of Shemitah, is the seventh year, and the year after the sabbatical year is called the year of Hakel, the year of ingathering, where it's important and particularly auspicious, an auspicious time to make gatherings. What kind of gatherings? Gatherings for the purpose of holiness. Gathering together for the purpose of doing something positive in the world, making positive changes, making, having a positive effect on the world. This year is particularly auspicious for that. It's the year of Hakel. So uh, I leave it off there with the idea that it's a time for the ingathering of our own powers, and particularly for gathering together, whether it's with family, whether it's with friends, making new groups, joining groups, etc. It's a good time to join a group, but be careful which group you join, of course. It shouldn't be a mob. It should be a crowd of people uh, which um, is involved in a positive purpose, and even more so in a holy purpose, if it's at all possible. Uh, and we see that the uh, the ideas of crowdfunding be, has become very popular recently, where all kinds of different people, perhaps with no connection to one another, fund a certain project. They fund a certain project together. Now, whatever it is that you're going to choose to do, that's, of, of course, every, up to everybody uh, in their own individual um, lives. Uh, but it is a good thing to do. Find a, a crowd or a group of one sort or another, whether it's an internet group, whether it's a local group, whatever, that's involved in some positive purpose uh, of, which will improve the world and make the world a better place for us all to live. Join in, put in your powers, and you'll see that you'll get much more out of it than you even put into it. So um, that's it for today. If there are questions, I'll have, be happy to take questions. I just want to mention again that today is the yacht site of 26th of Adar, is the yacht site, the uh, anniversary of the passing of Chaim Laser Ben Meir Akoin. And may his Nashom have an aliyah. This was dedicated by one of the students of this class. Okay.